Welcome to the Skull World Forum on Social Entrepreneurship, coming to you live from Oxford, England. We're going to be talking today, now, about changing the world of philanthropy and welcoming questions from you live on Facebook Live. And my guest today is Edgar Villanueva. A big welcome to you here. And we, you are calling for a radical change in the world of philanthropy. And your background is really very interesting. You're chair of the board of directors of the Native Americans in Philanthropy and also on the board of the Andrus Family Fund, which works for vulnerable youth. And you advise numerous foundations and NGOs. You're a member of the Lumbi tribe in mm -hmm. North Carolina. Is that where you were born? Uh, yes. OK, even though now you live in Brooklyn. Right. It's a Native American tribe. And you uh, have written a book, Decolonizing Wealth, which proposes that the native worldview offers an essential guidance to transforming institutions and unlocking access to money, to dollars. And something you said which is very moving, you said that money is my medicine. And in order to heal what hurts, to come back together as one human race, we need to decolonize wealth. So let me ask you first, and by the way, we've got the paints here because we are going to be painting yeah. your challenge to philanthropy here in about a minute. OK. So just to warn you, what needs to change in the world of philanthropy? So much needs to change. I, I mean, I think one is we have to become more comfortable having conversations that are uncomfortable. And so what do you mean by uncomfortable? Well, you know, it's interesting that people think my uh, frame or my platform is radical because I'm simply talking about love and philanthropy means love of people. So why is Philanthropy, it so, I never right. knew that. <laughs> so why is it so radical to talk about love? Um, I'm also just sharing truths. I'm talking about history. I'm talking about money. Um, you know, and how wealth has been accumulated. And it's like we just get so emotional and antsy when we're talking about money. We are in the money business. Why are we antsy talking about money? <laughs> so I think, you know, having spaces like this to have conversations um, and to really un uh, get uncomfortable is going to just help us move forward in, in ways that are different. So what needs to change according to you? You know, I think that, uh, you know, we need to make this the normal conversation. It should not be a radical conversation. We need to normalize talking about history, talking about race, talking about gender. All of those types of things should You're be talking coming. very abstract. Can we be a yeah. little bit more concrete? Oh, you want to get down to the concrete? Sure. Well, you know, we, we see in philanthropy, uh, we need more uh, diversity, but not just the diversity. We need inclusion. We need more people calling the shots, making decisions that come from the community who do not come from wealth. Often philanthropy is trying to help people like my family, and uh, yet my family uh, don't even know that uh, philanthropy exists in this kind of institutional way. Uh, we need to be less institutional and really become more like connected to the communities that we're trying to serve. And so that can happen by changing what boards look like, diversifying the staff, um, really, uh, you know, thinking about our processes are so convoluted and, 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 and uh, you know, we have uh, lots of barriers and infrastructure now in philanthropy that really make it challenging for those of us inside to connect with community and vice versa. You're talking a lot about philanthropy as this is a unified, cohesive thing that everybody knows about. Right. And people <laughs> outside the world of Skull World Forum and outside the world perhaps don't quite understand what you might mean. Can you just perhaps unpick what philanthropy is and what you're trying to decolonize. Sure, so you know, in the United States especially, we have this entire sector of philanthropy that is unique to that country because of our tax system. So wealthy folks or corporations can set up an institution that is a foundation, that is a philanthropy uh, to fund uh, nonprofit organizations and NGOs, and uh, they get a tax credit for that. And so on the surface, it looks like pretty harmless, a charitable kind of system to support communities. Uh, but, but underneath that, there are just a lot of complexities that um, are, are actually, in many ways, helping wealthy folks and wealthy corporations become richer. Because they're not having to pay tax on the Absolutely. money that's given to philanthropy. And Absolutely. What sort of money are we talking about? How many millions, billions is in US philanthropy? $800 billion, almost $900 billion now. And this is money that would have been taxed, right? It would have gone into uh, to support public education and health care and the safety net services. Um, however, folks have the option to set up their own foundations and to fund um, organizations of their choosing with very little accountability. And your assessment at the moment, 
overall, is philanthropy creating a net, net benefit or a net negative? You know, I think it could be a, a, a zero positive <laughs> net change or maybe even a negative when we look at the entire picture. Now, certainly philanthropy has done a lot of good. Um, philanthropy in the U.S. has had a major role in funding the civil rights movement. Um, it's been a laboratory to uh, come up with all kind of ideas that have been taken to scale by the government. So I do applaud those efforts. But when we look at the entire uh, picture of what's happening with money, only a small portion of philanthropic dollars actually leave the doors of foundations the majority of those majority of those dollars are actually invested in Wall Street and often in like extractive and harmful industries and so, so you're also calling for philanthropists to question more broadly where they're investing their money yes. not just on their grant making absolutely the grant making on on average is about five to seven percent of the assets and so what's happening with a 95 percent um, that's money that is also can be put to good use but often is not and when the boards and the expertise and the staff on these different philanthropy uh, foundations, what are you advocating in terms of diversity? You know, I think that we need uh, definitely diversity of perspectives uh, and, and lived experiences. And we need to be able to show up and, and bring different types of leadership. We often, in uh, the foundation world, I think the culture of our organizations, it feels like a forced assimilation. When what you, do you mean by forced assimilation? So, so for example, you know, when you come into an organization, there's a, there's a history and a legacy of um, culture in that organization, and you are expected to sort of take that on as a part of your identity. Did you find that experience? I did. Are you going to tell me did. which foundation? <laughs> you know, I've worked in three foundations now. I started in North Carolina. Uh, my first job was at the Cape Fear Reynolds Charitable Trust, which does amazing work to improve health care in North Carolina. But that family, that um, the Reynolds family, where that money came from, is a, was the wealthiest family in North Carolina, um, old tobacco money. And uh, often I felt uh, a contradiction. Was I supporting the community or was I expected to kind, to kind of hold up the legacy and the image of that family? And so um, I had things said to me like, uh, you know, you need a new car because the car you're driving doesn't really represent you know our family or we don't want people to think we don't pay our employees well and so there's an expectation sometimes that you perpetuate the uh, those optics of wealth and legacy um, which which is a focus of philanthropy in a lot of ways um, versus actually doing work in the community or being from the community and do you think your experience is typical I do, oh, yeah. Really? I mean, for a long time, I thought it was just me, and maybe I was crazy. <laughs> um, but it is a shared experience that many have, which is what uh, drove me to write a book about it. I collected stories from a lot of folks who um, got jobs in, in these organizations, and then when you get on the inside and you see what, how things are operating, there, there's a lot of questions that are raised around, like, what is this really about? Are we really trying to help the community? Are we really trying to uh, maintain some type of legacy uh, you know, around this money? That's really fascinating. Let's yeah. try and draw a picture now. So okay. we're going to be drawing a picture for the camera over here. Do you want okay. to pick a color? Sure. And we're talking about your challenge to philanthropy. In mm. what ways do you want to challenge philanthropy? And we can talk as you draw. You can tell me what, 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 what you're doing. Can I put a big, it's quite hard to do upside down, isn't it? I'm just trying to think which way the dollar goes. Uh, if I start with a big dollar sign, maybe that's helpful. Yes. OK. What else do you want to draw in terms of challenging this? this big structure of uh, this eight, nine billion dollar <laughs> US philanthropy. I think what I would want to do is right now that wealth is really concentrated, right? There's a, a limited number of, of institutions and individuals that control capital and control wealth. So it's really concentrated here. Mm. What I would want to see in the future is that this is kind of broken down into and, and reallocated into much, mm. much more of a shared share the wealth, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I talk about such things as reparations, for example. So this money, this big giant um, dollar sign in the middle, how did it get concentrated here? There's a history behind how wealth has been accumulated. Um, and in the US, through colonization, genocide, slavery, that history has allowed for this wealth to be 
you know, concentrated here with wealthy elite folks. What we need to do is understand that history and folks here should go through a process of understanding the trauma that exists outside of that bubble. And when you understand that trauma and you're open to that history, you're going to be uh, respectful of that history in a way that says, you know what, this money was made on the backs of these folks. We need to figure out ways to actually push that money outside this bubble. Um, and these folks here um, should be in a position to actually reclaim those resources because we all had a part in helping to, uh, you know, generate this wealth. And you talk about the value of lived experience, but you also acknowledge the value of expertise and data in understanding what, my paint's going all over me, <laughs> is understanding what works in terms of impact if you're dealing with healthcare or education and so forth. Right. Well, you know, I don't want to, uh, uh, you know, science is real and data is super helpful. Um, and I think, you know, often though, philanthropists are inclined to look at research from Ivy League institutions and create funding strategies, strategies around that. And that's certainly like okay to some, some extent, but there's often in the margins where uh, folks are outside of those elite institutions, there's a lot of solutions and a lot of ideas and great thinking. Um, you know, these communities are super resilient. Like my community, the Lumbee tribe in North Carolina, we were the first point of contact for colonization. In, the Amer in America. And so um, imagine it's been 500 years and we are still here. So there's, there's community wisdom and, and knowledge that exists there that is uh, so resourceful in terms of uh, the fact that we're still here. And so, what are your solutions to draw on some of these ideas which are outside the mainstream and are only trickling in in terms of thought and inspiration? You know, we have to, uh, you know, what's happened is often uh, here, people are beginning to realize that wisdom and they will, oh, we are, um, paint is going everywhere, which is fine. We can finger paint. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good on So here, uh, you know, they want to create one seat. So they're like, okay, we see the wisdom. Here's one seat for you. Come in. And, and so what it, what it is, is like, this table <laughs> is messy. <laughs> so the table here, now there's one seat for us, yes. right? So they, these folks are like, oh, we did a good job. We created a seat for you. Um, and so you have still like the control and the power is concentrated. And this person here does not feel empowered, right? To contribute in a, a real meaningful way. So instead of creating a, a table that is still like maybe white centric or white dominant or white design, uh, we need to think about a whole new situation where we reconstruct this table in a way that we all come together in a, with a more equal voice, a more equal power. And are you starting to see change? It's kind of interesting here at the yeah. Skull World Forum. Yesterday you spoke in front of thousands of delegates from across the world, including many people who work for foundations, and your voice is in the room, inside the tent. Yes. You know, I'm so hopeful about the change that I'm seeing. Um, I'm not just criticizing and critiquing philanthropy, um, although I am doing that at some level, but from a place of love and a place of hope. Um, every single day I'm hearing from folks who are saying, I read your book, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this work and we've made these changes in our organizations. So people are uh, changing their board of directors and bringing on folks with community experience. People are designing grant making programs to center uh, people of color and in indigenous communities. Um, we are seeing uh, just last in the last two weeks, there were two foundations who came to me and said, we are creating a portfolio to support indigenous peoples um, uh, uh, across the world. Another foundation said, we have decided as a board to move 25% of our funding into uh, native communities. And so there is a time of awakening, I feel like, and, and not just in the grant making side, but we're having real conversations in the US um, around uh, what is the culture of our institutions internally? How do we need to shift so that people of color and indigenous folks can come to work here and feel um, like they belong? And so that's, um, that's fantastic. And I will say the fact that I'm here at school and we're having conversations that, that I'm talking about colonization um, in Oxford, England is like a, a huge uh, step forward. Um, just having the conversation and opening our minds to think differently about what is the role that history has played in our work? How have we poten uh, potentially 
essentially as a sector um, been a part of that? Are be how have we been agnostic to that in ways that are um, that are not helpful? Is a big step forward. So I want to celebrate that. Brilliant. We'll yeah. leave on that optimistic note. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Edgar Villanueva, for your thoughts and for your painting oh. here, despite the uh, creativity on our hands. Right. Uh, coming up in uh, just 20, 25 minutes, looking at systems and tra uh, systems change with Peter Drobak from the Skoll Center of Social Entrepreneurship here in Oxford. Looking forward to see you then.